And we're okay. So I'd like to uh, let you know a little bit about what's going on. So welcome to the Church of Perpetual Life, and we are live streaming, and hello to everyone who has just joined us. I hope you got the message that we have quite a bit going on tonight, and I'd like to go over a little bit of that, and we're going to get right into the program. So again, my name is Neil Vandry. I will be your officiator here this evening, and the first thing I'd like to do is let you know about a change in our schedule for the event later this month. We originally scheduled for a Saturday uh, event with a Dr. Michael Lustgarten from Tufts University, but he has rescheduled into the summer, and uh, the sound sounds a little funny to me. Does it sound okay to you out there? Okay, good. I um, would like to let you know that January 23rd will now be January 28th, so that's the fourth Thursday here at Perpetual Life, which is our standard day. And on the fourth Thursday, January the 28th, we will be here at the same bat time, the same bat channel. That's to say the doors open at 6. At 7 o'clock, we will have a great speaker from the Cryonics Institute, all the way from Frozen, Michigan. And that's Joe Kowalski, the uh, leader over there at the Cryonics Institute, will come here. He's flying down just to be here for the presentation that he'll be giving. And I'll get you some information on that by email. How many people received an email about tonight's event? Got our emails? Great. For those of you who haven't given us your email, be sure to do so so that we can stay in touch with you. On February the 25th, we have the actress, the Argentinian-American singer, composer, and actress named Maria Entregas Abram Abramson. And Maria will be here speaking on February the 25th. And then we have also in March an event, and that will be Dr. Catherine Baldwin from Suspended Animation. Now, Dr. Catherine Baldwin will be here with a mobile cryonic vehicle. I know I didn't say that right, so Catherine, forgive me online, but it's basically an ambulance-type vehicle that would come to you if you're signed up for a cryonic suspension. It will come to where you are to begin the process. Very interesting stuff happening this year. We're excited about all this and much, much more to come. This evening, we're going to get right underway, as I understand our very own Ben Best has a great program and has been doing some traveling. I'd like to let you know a little bit about Ben. He was the president and CEO of the Cryonics Institute, and that's the world's second largest cryonics organization for nine years. He was the uh, president and CEO, and he's, be he's best known and a well-known activist in the cryonics and life extension uh, advocates, advocate. He holds an undergraduate degrees in pharmacy from the University of British Columbia and physics and computing sciences and finance from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. Ben Best is also certified as a professional registered parliamentarian by the National Association of Parliamentarians, and he currently works for the Life Extension Foundation. So let's all give a warm Hollywood welcome to our very own Mr. Ben Best. Okay, is my mic working? You're doing good. My mic's working. All right. So uh, this is Bedford Day. Uh, um, and that's that's uh, the, the, what we're celebrating, January 12th. Uh, 49 years ago today, uh, Bedford was, uh, was uh, cryopreserved, placed in uh, liquid nitrogen. It's been in liquid nitrogen ever since. So uh, mark on your calendar for next year. It'll be the 50th anniversary. Uh, for people who doubt that you can keep a person uh, in liquid nitrogen for that long, uh, Bedford is showing it's possible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk begin talking about James Bedford and his preservation, and then I will, most of my presentation will be about my trip to Egypt. Uh, so let's just start with Bedford. Um, he was the first person cryonically preserved. Uh, he wrote to Robert Edinger, who was the father of cryonics in June 1966, saying he was dying of cancer. Uh, and he was uh, preserved at the age of 73 uh, on this uh, day uh, 49 years ago. And he's uh, currently in, at Alcor Life Extension Foundation. Now, um, he's, uh, he was a PhD psychology professor. He wrote seven books on vocational training. He loved to travel, including a 1958 African safari tour of Amazon rainforest and a, a drive to Alaska on Alcan Highway, as well as all over Europe. 
Um, so the guy who, who coordinated the whole thing was uh, Robert Nelson. Now, Robert Nelson was, <laughs> uh, by training, a TV repairman, uh, but he was extremely enthusiastic when he found Edinger's book and, and became president of the Crying Society of California, uh, and organized the, 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 that uh, as a new organization. And he's, uh, he's got two books. Uh, he, he wrote We Froze the First Man in 1968, and then uh, most more recently, he's written uh, Freezing People is Not Easy. Now, something about We Froze the First Man, uh, uh, we can, there was a woman in 1966 who was embalmed for 18 hours after death, refrigerated, uh, and then temporary place in liquid nitrogen, and then buried. Uh, there's some question about her motivations. Possibly she was uh, motivated to, um, um, for cryonics reasons, but possibly not. It didn't seem to be a very well organized uh, or well thought out plan. Uh, and um, so I guess you have to emphasize the word man in this case. It isn't just sexist. There might have been a woman who was preserved for uh, cryonics reasons. Um, so um, there's uh, Robert Nelson and, uh, and Dr. Dante Bruno. But Dr. Bruno was a very, he's a research physician, biophysicist. He was very interested in this whole uh, business of cryonics uh, from a technical point of view. He designed perfusion equipment. Uh, here's uh, Bedford on, on, the, on the being uh, cooled with uh, ice. And um, uh, there's a heart-lung machine uh, being used to get, uh, keep circulation going uh, while, they, while they cool him. And um, uh, also on the team, uh, not exactly on the team, but uh, Dr. Abel, who's a, a cryonics-friendly physician. He actually uh, met Dr. Bedford at a uh, uh, or at least met uh, the cryonics people at, uh, at a cryonics gathering uh, in California. Uh, and the hospice uh, nursing home uh, where Bedford was uh, kept. And then Robert Prohoda, he was a chemist and low temperature, uh, low metabolism expert who was involved in the case. Now he was in the a nursing home, so that's, that's, a good, that's a good beginning. I mean, a lot of people just uh, who are who get cryonically preserved now uh, don't have a lot of some, some of the advantages that Bedford had. He was in a nursing home and uh, they, they expected him to live two weeks. It, it came as quite a surprise, but uh, um, um, the nursing staff told, uh, told um, Dr. Abel to rush over because he was, because uh, um, Bedford seemed to be deteriorating fast. So Dr. Abel was on the scene and able to promptly pronounce death. So that's, that's another, uh, thing that doesn't happen too often where you have actually a physician on the scene as soon as the heart stops. And uh, so they dumped ice on Dr. Bedford while administering artificial respiration and chest compressions. And after two hours of uh, cooling and compressions, uh, Dr. Abel sum summoned Dr. Bruno and Robert Nelson to uh, do the perfusion. Now perfusion is when you actually uh, uh, replace the, um, the blood in the patient with um, a, um, a an antifreeze solution, something to prevent ice from forming in the in the patient. So, but unfortunately, Dr. Bruno wasn't expecting uh, uh, Bedford to die so soon. So his perfusion equipment was not ready, and uh, so um, Bedford, instead of perfusing him, uh, Bedford uh, was injected with the, uh, this fit DMSO solution about 50 to 100 times through his carotid arteries. So, uh, he probably, and he bled, he bled a lot. So there might have been some blood replacement. It wasn't just a matter of, of injecting this uh, DMSO into him. But anyway, this is Robert Nelson uh, uh, shown injecting into the carotid artery. Actually, this is just sort of a pose because Robert uh, actually got sick during the process and had to leave the room several times and came back and uh, Bruno is actually the person who did most of the work. So Bled Bedford was then placed on dry ice for several days before being transferred to liquid nitrogen. He was maintained in liquid nitrogen by his family until being transferred to, to, uh, uh, fr from the family to Trans Time in 1976 for about a year. Uh, but Trans Time was too expensive, so they, the family took over again. But uh, they, the family was running out of money. This was a very expensive proposition. So 
Alcor volunteered to, t to take Bedford without any charge, and he was transferred to Alcor Life Extension Foundation in 1982, and he's remained there ever since. Now, his body was examined in 1991 uh, very carefully, with, you know, the, keeping him still in, in uh, liquid nitrogen and vit nitrogen vapor. And what they saw was that the, uh, Bedford had not been uh, warmed above cryogenic temperature in any, any of the 24 years uh, before Alcor received him. So, um, the, Robert Nelson had a cryonic society of California and he was storing patients, but Bedford's family didn't want to, I guess they didn't trust Nelson. It's hard to say what their motives were, but anyway, uh, uh, as it turned out, all of the Chronic Society of California Chronic patients perished due to bad judgment and financial mismanagement by Robert Nelson. Um, I mean, it, I, I'd say, you know, you can almost, many people in the Chronic movement think it was a criminal, criminal, uh, criminal bad judgment. And, uh, but, um, um, I, my my feel my sense of Nelson is he just uh, he was run by his emotions too much and and uh, um, the, uh, many of the, the the people he first took especially were he took f with without any funding at all, figuring that he'd get people with funding later and and they would cover all the costs and uh, you know and these were people who had been very early and instrumental in in forming the uh, the Chronic Society of California so. Uh, it was bad, very bad judgment on his part. He just didn't have money to keep them, keep them uh, uh, preserved. Um, so anyway, they, by 1979, all of those patients had been thawed and buried or cremated. So this was just a real disaster as far as uh, people in cryonics are concerned. And, and uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the space shuttle explosion. It's a very bad start to a new technology. And... Um, um, so, <clears throat> anyway, um, um, uh, that, that, that was in 1979, uh, and uh, we haven't had, we've had a lot of patients stored since then, and, and they've all been maintained in, as I say, Bedford for 49 years. Now, Bedford uh, had doubts about whether he was worth preserving uh, after, he, after he'd sort of initially arranged it. Uh, Robert Edinger uh, persuaded him that his client his chronic preservation would not only benefit himself, but his family, his friends, and society at large, because nobody else had been preserved before. He'd be the first person and, uh, to, to be maintained for chronic purposes. And so he agreed, but uh, apparently not for selfish uh, quest for immortality, but as a precedent for extended lifespan of others. So um, any questions on this part before I get into the Egypt part? No questions? All right. So the main part of the presentation is about this trip to Egypt I took during the last holiday season, most recent holiday season. Um, well, what I figured I'd learn hieroglyphics and go to Egypt and, and uh, learn about the ancient Egyptian quest of immor for immortality. Uh, I discovered hieroglyphics is a lot harder to learn than I imagined. I thought it was just a bunch of, a few pictures, <laughs> but... Uh, it's, it's not that easy, and it's far easier to learn about archaeology and history than about the mindset of the ancient Egyptian. I, t I took a lot of photos, but I will talk about uh, the, uh, the, the mindset of ancient Egyptians as much as I can figure it out uh, a little later. But uh, as far as hieroglyphics is concerned, uh, this is a very simplified uh, a picture. That, that, that there's actually no vowels. Uh, in uh, hieroglyphics, and you know they're all phonetic. It's like you know, have these symbols for, for, uh, for, for letters. You know, like this, this is B. A foot is B, and uh, so forth. And uh, but actually, there's 134 distinct uh, Egyptian symbols that are used to spell a multitude of words. Uh, this is also over, overly simplified, but uh, this is like a letter for letter uh, uh, translation of, of the word of the. Cartouche for the Ptolemies and Cleopatra, uh, each of these symbols representing the, the letter below them. Now, Cartouche is, uh, was uh, an, uh, this ellipse that's surrounding, oops, the ellipse that's surrounding the, uh, um, surrounding the uh, hieroglyphics. 
And the ellipsis was supposed to have magical properties. It's supposed to protect the name and the person who's inside. And, um, uh, and um, only pharaohs are able to put their names in, uh, were able to put their names in cartouches. Um, and cartouches were actually the key to, uh, to deciphering hieroglyphics in the uh, early 19th century. Uh, actually, uh, there was, uh, the Egyptians had no interest in their history, apparently, uh, before Napoleon arrived. And Napoleon's, uh, one of Napoleon's soldiers discovered the Rosetta Stone. And uh, using the Rosetta Stone and these cartouches, they were able to figure out what all these hieroglyphics meant. So anyway, that's just a, it shows you there's a lot more than the few symbols I showed you. There's a lot of symbols. And then the worst part is you've got to combine them into words. Um, this, this one, you might uh, sort of, I mean, I, I, it, it was helpful to some extent. Uh, this, this one is a uh, long life. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that the Egyptians were interested in and uh, we're interested in too, at least I am. Um, so uh, just to give you a time lam timeline of uh, uh, Egyptian history as far as uh, what we're concerned, and that's, uh, this is the old kingdom of, of uh, Egypt and uh, the pyramids and Sphinx at Giza were created at that time. Middle kingdom only had some small uh, pyramids and the new kingdom um, resulted in deep tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And then after that was the Greek pharaohs, uh, Alexander the Great followed by the Ptolemies, uh, ending with Cleopatra. And after that the Romans ruled, but uh, uh, they, they weren't rulers, they didn't have much respect for Egyptian uh, culture. So this is a, a basically a, I, I went to the Cairo area where the pyramids are. There's Giza and Saqqara. And then uh, I took a plane down to Luxor and, um, and spent time exploring this area down here. And so um, we'll uh, start with Saqqara in the, in the north of Egypt. And um, the, this, this is the, the, the first pyramid, attempts to build pyramids were these mud brick things. And uh, they, they obviously didn't have much staying power. Uh, a great uh, innovation was, the build, was to build, use stones instead of mud brick. And this is still standing. Uh, this is a, it's actually the first stone building in the world, this uh, step pyramid at uh, uh, Saqqara. Uh, so, uh, but the, you know, the, the big uh, pyramids are in Giza. And so there's three large pyramids there, a bunch of small pyramids as well, and uh, one sphinx. And uh, you can see the sphinx there guarding the pyramids. Um, Let's see. So it says no climbing. This sign here says no climbing <laughs> on the pyramids. Um, but um, you can actually go into the uh, Great Pyramid, the biggest pyramid, uh, and uh, there's the entrance. And you'd have to do a little bit of climbing at least to get to the entrance. And uh, that's what I did. And uh, the entrance, uh, let's see, oops. The entrance, oops. Uh, the entrance uh, will, you know, there's a long, uh, there's a long, uh, let's see, I don't know, path you have to say to get up to the where the uh, where the um, pharaoh was held. Oops, keep the wrong one. Uh, and the pharaoh would be up here. The sarcophagus of the pharaoh would be up here. So you're going to the entrance and you go up this long uh, tunnel, and uh, so it looks about like this, um, and. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a long climb up and a long climb down. Um, so the pharaoh was a god in Egypt. And um, uh, the people believed they were gods and the pharaohs believed they were gods. They were an intermediary between gods and humans. Uh, the god Ptah uh, was, was, a, was a god. Uh, he created the universe. Uh, Mat was the goddess of truth and justice and order. And the pharaoh was responsible for, as an intermediary, he was uh, enforced justice and order. And, uh, and the, the great evil in, in Egypt was chaos. And um, um, the, the, so Egypt, Egypt was a real authoritarian theocracy with, you know, when you've got the, 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 the head of the country being run by a person who's actually a god. And uh, he, he was, he was uh, maintaining order against chaos and what he means by order and what he means by chaos 
had a lot to do with uh, enforcing his 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 uh, his, uh, <clears throat> his regime on everybody else. <laughs> uh, but you know, he isn't enforcing it exactly because uh, um, you know he's regarded as God. So so uh, people are very willing and eager to obey God and do what God set, tells them to do. And um, so he, uh, him, he symbolically the Pharaoh would hold a shepherd's crook. Uh, because he was a good shepherd looking after the welfare of his people, and a flail uh, to goad the flock. Uh, that's one interpretation. Another is to separate the wheat from the chaffs in administering justice. So you can imagine Jehovah's Witnesses building a pyramid for God. You know, these, these would be highly motivated people. They aren't just building it for some jerk that <laughs> happens to be in power. They're doing it for God. Um, so there's me standing by the pyramid. Uh, the Sphinx, I mean. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the Sphinx, Sphinx uh, had, had the, the front of its face knocked off. Um, uh, somebody just dis destroyed the nose. And uh, as it turns out, it was uh, uh, probably by some Sufi, Sufi Muslim who was outraged by the reverence local peasants were showing to the Sphinx. Now, I saw lots of uh, temples and tombs that were... Uh, where the faces were obliterated. Everything else was in good shape, but the faces were obliterated. And, and I think early Christians or Muslims were, were uh, this was their way of combating paganism, was obliterating these faces. So here you see, here's, here's a, something from a, a tomb or, or whatever, and, and a temple, and, and look, look, all the faces are wiped out here. But everything else is, you know, the hieroglyphics are, you know, in fine detail and so forth. And um, uh, same thing here. We've got uh, uh, this is another this is another temple, and you know, this t uh, these uh, the faces at the top. All the faces at the tops of these columns are smashed in. But you know, all the, there's a lot of decoration and so forth that's, uh, that hasn't been touched. So anyway, um, um, we get to the story of Isis. He's the god of afterlife in Egypt, and. Um, uh, this, this story uh, portrays him as the first person who was ever mummified. And by the time of the Middle Kingdom, Isis had become the most popular of the gods. And uh, the story of his life and afterlife was a story most often told. Uh, mummification of Osiris created the means for everyone to be resurrected through mummification. And uh, the center of the cult of Osiris was in the city of Abydos. So I visited Abydos. Uh, and... Uh, but every Egyptian, every ancient Egyptian was expected to make at least one pilgrimage to Abydos in their lifetime. So a little more detail here. Um, this legend was a, a story, uh, this religious story, let's put it that way. It was, it's the most, uh, most uh, retold story in ancient religion. So here's the story. Osiris was a pharaoh and Isis was his sister and wife. Now the brother of Osiris, Seth, kills Isis, kills Osiris cuts his body into pieces and distributes the pieces all over Egypt. So Isis turns herself into a bird and she flew all over Egypt gathering the pieces and reassembling them. And then uh, once he was, as soon as he was, he was resurrected long enough to, uh, to impregnate Isis. And then uh, he was mum immediately mummified so he could be, later be resurrected because you had to be mummified to be, to be resurrected. And uh, Osiris uh, became the first person ever to become, be resurrected. So, and, and uh, by mummifying Osiris, then this was the means for everybody to become resurrected because they could just resurrect, they could mummify themselves as well. And um, the son of the, I, I said that, uh, that uh, Isis was impregnated. Their son was uh, uh, Horus, who, was, who defeated Seth, uh, the evil brother who who'd cut Osiris to pieces. And, uh, and Horus became the god of pharaohs often portrayed as a, as a falcon. Hulk, Horus was also a god of war and the god of the sky. So here's, a, here's a, from Temple Walls, this shows you the story uh, in detail and uh, in a way. This is the bird, it's Osiris. Here's, a, I mean, who's, it's Iris, Isis. And um, uh, this is uh, Osiris being reanimated. And if you can see his penis is the main thing being... Uh, uh, reanimated at this point, and um, uh, that, that's the way uh, Isis becomes impregnated. And um, then we have Isis uh, 
assuming more of a human form. She's still got her wings here. And, um, um, and then in the next scene, uh, we have uh, Osiris immediately being embalmed. And, uh, and uh, Isis is helping with the embalming process. I mean, the, the mummification process. I wouldn't call it embalming. It's mummification. So Osiris was the god of afterlife. Um, and on, uh, uh, on Judgment Day, you went to the underworld, and um, the heart of, your, of the deceased is weighed. So this is a scale, and the heart, the heart of the deceased is, is uh, being weighed, and a heart that's heavy with sins is relegated to, to uh, oblivion. Actually, what happens is this, this monster here eats the heart, and uh, that's the end of the, of the dead person. And, uh, and, but um, Osiris holds a shepherd's crook and a flail, uh, showing like, like he's a pharaoh. He's the god of the underworld, just the way the pharaohs are the god of the up, gods of the upper world. So this is what I saw at the, uh, the Assyrian. They call it the Assyrian uh, cult center, Osiris cult center. Um, of course, uh, uh, it's, most of it is underwater right now. So, uh, it's, you know, but supposedly uh, the rumor, the, the legend is that Osiris is, uh, the remains of uh, Osiris, the mummified remains are down here. And I'm not sure how his reanimation or re, re, re resurrection fits into that. But anyway, that's part of the legend. So um, Thebes was the capital of the new, as I said, uh, you know, there's several periods of Egyptian history and the new kingdom was the most recent, uh, truly Egyptian period. And um, the, the center of the of uh, the the center of Egypt uh, had formerly been in the north uh, at the near the in the delta, but it was now moved down to Luxor, and uh, uh, what, what's what's now Luxor, and uh, the Temple of Ammon at, at the Karnak religious complex employed 81,000 people. Uh, it was the most important place of worship, so that's that's a lot of people to be working in a temple uh, in. Uh, um, many thousands of years ago. And Ammon was the chief god of ancient Egypt. And um, the holy trim, 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 trinity of Karnak was uh, Ammon, uh, Mut, and uh, Khonsu. Um, the, um, Osiris is also the god of agriculture. So um, the, the annual germinating of seeds, because the, the Nile would flood every year, and, and uh, the flooding of the Nile would actually bring a lot of topsoil down from uh, 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 from the source of the Nile, and and uh, it was it was uh, really wonderful in a way because they didn't need any fertilizer. They had there's all this this uh, fresh topsoil every year, and uh, so um, um, uh, agriculture was tremendously important in ancient Egypt. But the underworld wasn't uh, just a hell; it was different. There was many gods dwelling in the underworld along with Osiris. You know, there may have been Judgment Day in the underworld, but uh, there's uh, other good things about it, and um, uh, including Osiris being the god of resurrection and regeneration. You don't have a, a, a Satan playing that role, that's for sure. And um, uh, and then uh, the gods, the sun god Ray. Uh, would, would travel across the, the sky every day. And uh, when he finished traveling across the sky, he would, he would go to the underworld to be with Osiris and uh, be rejuvenated so he could uh, uh, be fresh for the next day. Um, so uh, as far as Isis is concerned, she, was, she was, uh, came to be considered the ideal wife and mother. And there, were lots of, there was lots of uh, worship of Isis. There's Isis with her son Horus. Uh, nursing, and there are many temples of Isis uh, in uh, Egypt uh, that were later converted into temples of the Virgin Mary. Um, there, you know, many of the gods had their own temples. This was the uh, Temple of Horus at uh, Edfu, which I visited. And um, uh, there's, here's the mortuary temple of Hatshetsu uh, near the Valley of the Kings. Now, um, uh, let's have a closer look at it. And uh, that's, she was the most powerful uh, female pharaoh in the history of Egypt. And she's also been called the first uh, great woman in history. Uh, she assumed the throne in 1478 BC. Before she became pharaoh, she was, uh, in, uh, during her father's reign, she was, had the official title of God's wife. And, um, 
she, she enhanced Egypt through trade rather than war, and she also built many monuments and uh, uh, she had, she, they, they, that lauded her and promoted her accomplishments. And um, her mortuary temple contained sanctuaries for gods who could promote her in the afterlife, including Cyrus and, uh, and um, his cult, the Promised Resurrection. But the temple itself was dedicated to the god Ammon, the, the chief god in the, of Thebes. And uh, mortuary temples were intended to be near tombs. Uh, th th these are different than the, uh, than the temples of the gods, like the Temple of Horus. Uh, these are actually temples of pharaohs. And uh, they're intended to be near tombs and to serve as a place of remembrance and worship of the pharaohs. And uh, she was uh, probably buried in the Valley of the Kings. I think, it's, I think there's little uh, doubt about that, actually. So, um, so there's a picture of her temple. And uh, uh, she's got a good ego. She's got lots of statues of herself. Um, and um, let's see. There's a... Uh, a few closer look at some of her statues. And um, uh, there's a temple next door to hers, and she just uh, uh, f freely uh, partook of the, of the temple to create her own temple, with, used it for building material. Uh, fortunately uh, for her, nobody did the same thing to her temple. Um, <clears throat> OK, as I mentioned, uh, Thebes was the capital of the New Kingdom, and it's now the modern city of Luxor. And uh, the Temple of Ar Ar I see, I mentioned that, I think. Uh, anyway, it employed 81,000 people. Ammon was the chief god of Thebes. Now, Karnak was on the east back of the Nile. So they put, they put, uh, they put uh, the places where people live on the east bank of the Nile, because that's where the sun rises. And the tombs of the Valley of the Kings and other, other uh, mortuary temples and so forth were on the west side, because the sun sets in the west. So the West and the East were very important to the ancient Egyptians. Now the Valley of the Kings, as I say, was on the West side, uh, but by the you know, the, you know, by the time of the New Kingdom, the, the pyramids had already been robbed, and um, a big building a big pyramid uh, for a pharaoh was uh, like a big rob me sign. You know, there's lots of loot in here. Come, come and uh, get it. And uh, so that that wasn't uh, the, the, in the New Kingdom. The pharaohs decided it wasn't a good idea. And they decided to have very deep tombs in the desolate, desolate desert valley, now called the Valley of Kings. And uh, they, did the, they were burying pharaohs uh, during that whole period uh, uh, between these two years. And uh, it was helpful that, to be in a desert. Uh, being, the dryness was very protective, and, and it could be constantly guarded. But well into the 20th century, all the tombs in the Valley of the Kings had been robbed except the tomb of Tuk, uh, Tuk, uh, Tukan Haman, which uh, was only discovered in 1922. And this King Tut was only a boy king, but his tomb was found to be laden with gold and other valuables. And his mask was uh, 22.5 pounds of gold, and his inner coffin was uh, 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 243 pounds of gold. So there was his mask. Now, the purpose of this mask was so that the... Uh, um, they wore the mask just to make sure their spirit would recognize them. So it's supposed to be a, a real likeness of, of King Tut. And, the, and so and they put that over. And, uh, I guess if you've been in, uh, mummified, uh, your face not be as, it might not be as recognizable as if you have a mask to wear. And uh, there's this, uh, lots of people are photographing. That's his, uh, t his, his inner coffin. He had more than one coffin, but the innermost one was made of uh, as I say, 243 pounds of gold. Um, so anyway, uh, this is a, a review of where I went. As I say, I, I after uh, I, I was, uh, uh, by the way, last picture was uh, those, uh, those coffins, uh, the, uh, those uh, uh, gold pieces are in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, which is where I took, took the picture of the co coffin. Um, so anyway, um, I, I flew from Cairo down to uh, Luxor, uh, so I could explore this area down here uh, a, a bit, and uh, I think I got a, this is a closer picture of that area. So I visited most of these cities, uh, you know, Ab Abydos I mentioned, and, and uh, Thebes, and, and uh, all, all these things in this area. And here's another one. This is a clo close up of the Luxor area. And there you've got the Valley of the Kings, and that Shepsep's temple is just right by it. 
There's uh, no, tombs for nobles, and uh, Valley of the Queens is over here. And uh, then there's, the, 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 as far as for the living, uh, on, the, on the east side of the Nile, we got the Karnak Temple, which is a huge temple. And then, um, and then uh, below it is uh, the Luxor Temple. And the two are, were ancient, in ancient times connected, and there's, there's being restored. So actually, I took a, a balloon ride over the West Bank uh, to uh, take a, a, an aerial view of, uh, of uh, things. And um, so this is what I saw. There's uh, uh, the temple of uh, Hatshepsut, which I showed earlier, is right here. And then the Valley of the Kings is this valley here. Very, uh, you know, it's got a road going up, and, and uh, there's tombs uh, lining this valley. It's extremely, extremely dry and, and also hot. This, uh, uh, this uh, I guess in the summertime, this, this uh, Temple of Hatshepsut is, is re re reportedly the hottest place on Earth. <laughs> um, so this is a, uh, a blurry picture of the Valley of the Kings. Kings there's all these uh, tombs uh, in the valley. And uh, once again, uh, it, like climbing up, uh, I just use the same picture again, but it, it, in the case, uh, you know, I, you can't take pictures either in the tombs or in the pyramids. So, uh, so this, is, this is actually a, not a picture of either one, but this is, this is the, what I would see. Uh, you know, in the, in the pyramid uh, that I went into, uh, I, I'd climb this, this long uh, uh, passageway up to the uh, sarcophagus of Pharaoh, and whereas uh, in the Valley of the Kings, I would climb down this long passageway to the sarcophagus of the Pharaoh. So um, uh, temples were religious centers, but they were reserved for priests. Uh, they weren't open to the public, and uh, like, a, like a, our modern religious institutions. And they had holy of holy chapels that contained statues of the gods. Now, the gods uh, in ancient Egypt weren't necessarily benevolent. They often required offerings to earn their goodwill and benefits. So to, 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 get, to, to get their goodwill and benefits, the police the priests would clothe and feed these statues every day. Uh, the statues would eat the spiritual essence of the food, and the priests would eat the leftovers. Um, the, uh, the priests were initiated into higher orders of knowledge by elaborate so ceremonies, which inspired the mystery religions of the Greeks and the Romans and the Freemasons, and, uh, and, and now also the Freemasons and the Rosicrucians. There's actually a Rosicrucian uh, Egyptian museum in, in uh, California, which I visited many years ago. Anyway, priests with higher levels of initiation had access to more areas of the temple. Um, I am actually, uh, I was inspired by, by this, the mystery of uh, secret societies and so forth. And when I was in a fraternity, college fraternity, I, I was uh, given the privilege of designing the initiation ceremonies for our uh, our new pledges. Anyway, these uh, rituals often end with symbolic eating of the body of the god, which uh, we can call a Eucharist. Um, so here's the uh, Karnak Temple complex. Uh, you know, the, just to, to imagine that, you know, many thousands of years ago, the Egyptians building these huge, huge monuments, the the the, uh, the um, <clears throat> pyramids and these huge. Uh, Temples, it's a huge complex. And I says, I said 81,000 people were working in this thing. And uh, uh, this is a close up of some of the pillars. And uh, in particular, uh, uh, this is a, a cartouche, I believe. Uh, anyway, this is a cartouche of a pharaoh, cartouches of a pharaoh uh, that are actually on the pillars. I believe that's, uh, and this is a, uh, this uh, obelisk uh, Hatshepsut was uh, installed at Karnak. Uh, one of the, her successor tried to cover it up, but didn't do a very good job. And uh, so now it's exposed and probably inspired the Washington Monument. Um, and there was a sacred pond for baptism and purification. It's a little looks a little stagnant these days, but I think it was very, very clean and pure uh, in the days of the uh, uh, ancient Egyptians. And um, <clears throat> there's also another temple south of, uh, just south of Karnak, which I showed earlier, which is the Luxor Temple. And um, there's uh, more pillars and statues, naturally. 
and um, th there was a um, the the this is a separate chapels uh, in the Holy Tr They had separate chapels for gods. So this, these are three chapels, one for Ammon, the father, uh, one for uh, Mutt, 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 the mother, and uh, <clears throat> one for Kansu, the son. Uh, and um, so each, each had a separate ch chapel, and they were the Holy Trinity, father, mother, and uh, son. Now, um, Ramses the Great, uh, Ramses the Second was... Uh, uh, probably, I mean, uh, he was the king of kings. Let's put it that way. He was, he he ruled Egypt for uh, uh, 67 years, uh, and he had 100, about 100 children. Uh, in the fifth year of his rule, he, he fought the Battle of Kadesh, and he spent the rest of his life uh, building huge monuments that uh, glorified his role in the Battle of Kadesh. So, these guys were really big on self-promotion. That's pretty clear, and. Um, Actually, uh, is, is part of his legacy is all, all but uh, uh, all but one. Eight out of ten of the pharaohs of subsequent of the subsequent dynasty took the name Ramses, Ramses the third to Ramses the ninth, in memory of Ramses the second. So uh, the Battle of uh, Kadesh, uh, it was fought against the Hittites in 1274 B.C. Largest cha chariot battle ever fought. Five to five thousand to six thousand chariots were involved. And it resulted in the world's, world's first treaty, peace treaty. If you go to the United Nations building uh, in uh, <clears throat> New York City, uh, the, there's actually a, a plaque uh, commemorating this uh, peace treaty uh, of Ramses II with the Hittites, between the Egyptians and the Hittites. There was Kaddish, uh, that was where the, uh, Kaddish, that was where the battle was fought. Um, so, um, he also built the Abu Simbel Temple. Uh, it was like Mount Rushmore, you know, where you've got four presidents carved into the side of a mountain in Montana, uh, except that the four, instead, of the, instead of the faces of four presidents, it's four statues of Ramses II. And uh, it's, it's been described as ego cast in stone because <laughs> he's got all these, these huge statues of himself. And so that's the door to the temple. And... Uh, uh, so that'll give you a, 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 some sense of the uh, of the size of these statues carved right into the mountain, and um, it also has a memorial temple uh, called uh, Ramesseum, and uh, it's called he, he called it the House of a Million Years of Ramses II. So he figured it'd last for a long time, and. Um, so it featured a statue of him that was 60, 62 feet high and 25, 21 feet wide. A huge statue, obviously. Now the Greek name for Ramses II, they you know, had a special name for him. The Greeks, they called him Ozymandias. And the po poet uh, Percy Shelley wrote a poem titled uh, Ozymandias, spoofing the inscription at the base of Ramses' statue. So here was the, the, the inscription. It says, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my work, she mighty, and despair. So poetically, um, Shelley Wright wrote that the statue of the once mighty Amandius had been reduced to rubble, along with his might and his pretensions of immortality. So that's what it looks like today. Uh, and um, uh, it's uh, looked this way for thousands of years, but uh, the modern Egyptians are planning to restore it, which will sort of... Uh, take some of the kick out of uh, Shelley's poem. Um, so, uh, and the tombs of Ramses II, the tombs of Ramses II was by far the largest tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and the tomb of his beloved wife, <coughs> wife Nefertari, was by far the largest tomb in the Valley of the Queens. And uh, both tombs are undergoing restor restoration, they're close to the public. So there's his mummy, uh, he died at age about uh, about 90 years after ruling for 67 years. The average lifespan of Egyptians in his time was about 22. Infant mortality was high, but uh, Egyptian rarely lived to the age of 40. Um, and um, his arms are positioned to hold a crook and a flail. Undoubtedly, he was, holding a, he was uh, buried with a crook and a flail that were made of gold that were stolen many years ago. Um, so uh, most people want to be remembered after death. Um, uh, they want to have a legacy. 
So uh, this is just sort of my speculation here, but I think for many people, their primis, primary legacy in life is their children, their grandchildren, their descendants. Uh, many other people, the, the major accomplishments of their lives, uh, uh, that's the, the, the live on for the benefit of mankind or what they call their legacy. And I'm just guessing that the desire for a legacy is as close as most people come to wanting, actually wanting physical immortality. Um, uh, uh, this is a favorite quote of Cryonesis by Woody Allen. Is, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I want to live on in my apartment. So uh, why did Egyptians believe mummification was so important for an afterlife? Well, possibly the hot, dry desert removed water and reduced decay. So seeing well-preserved features of the deceased may have caused the Egyptians to think some aspect of personal identity was also preserved. And uh, the process of mummification uses uh, salts to increase the dehydration and thus increase preservation. And the brain and other internal organs, not the heart, were removed to uh, prevent putrefaction. And uh, then the body was covered with tar to protect against insects, insects before being wrapped in linen. So um, tens of millions, tens or even hundreds of millions of Egyptians were mummified during the 3,000 years of, of uh, ancient Egyptian culture. You know, if they weren't, if they were poor, they would, they would just be mummified and, and buried somewhere in the desert. Uh, but if they were rich, uh, if they were pharaohs, uh, they, they'd b begin building their tombs or their pyramids uh, as soon as they started their reign. And uh, the, the process would continue throughout uh, much of their reign. Uh, often they died before the tombs were finished. And so uh, they had to do with, with what they had. Anyway, the mummification process became increasingly elaborate, uh, requiring the wrapping of amulets with the mummies and lots of ritualistic blessings during the wrapping. The Book of the Dead, the Book of the Dead and other sacred texts contain 192 spells, utterances, and incantations with magic powers to assist the, de the deceased on the path towards resurrection and afterlife. So why was there all this complex complexity? Um, I'm, I, I don't know. Was it to create business for the priests? <laughs> I mean, it, the priests are obviously the one making up all, all these ceremonies and and uh, telling people that they were important uh, uh, probably did increase their business. So um, the ancient Egyptians were buried in a tomb with objects they could use in the afterlife, including pictures of food, tools, cosmetics, medicines, and for the rich statues of servants. Now Neanderthals have been found in shallow graves with stone tools, and there's undisputed, but there, you know that's that's questionable uh, as to whether that, that was an intentional burial, but. Uh, that there's undisputed evidence of burial uh, with goods that for an afterlife uh, found in caves uh, as old as 100,000 years old. And um, the logic, so the logic of imagining a physical afterlife requiring physical goods is as old as civilization. It wasn't a, just an idea of the, of the Egyptians, although obviously Neanderthals and, and these earlier peoples uh, didn't go to the trouble of mummification. But so were the ancient Egyptians assessed with Death, or were they obsessed with life? Um, I don't know. Modern religions will t will emphasize a spiritual afterlife, uh, but you know how can how can you compare the intensity of, of the modern desire for spiritual immortality with the intensity of the desire for immortality of the ancient Egyptians? I don't know. I mean, it seems as if the Egyptians were uh, spent all their time, uh, spent much time anyway, um, thinking about and preparing for immortality and afterlife and and uh, it's hard to compare that the, you know it's it's hard to compare people with modern religions you know the these uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, these people these uh, Muslims who, uh, who who go around uh, uh, murdering people and believing that they're going to instantly go to paradise uh, may uh, if they really believe that, if they're really believing that this is their way to get into paradise, that would certainly uh, that, that might even make them more uh, uh, more strong believers than uh, and more desirous of immortality than the ancient Egyptians. Uh, but uh, anyway, that, it's hard to compare as far as uh, finding out what I, 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 I just food for thought is the best I 
I could get. I can't say as my trip to Egypt resulted in my understanding the quest for immortality of the ancient Egyptians. So that's it. Any How questions? About, uh, maybe some questions for Ben on his trip and his presentation. I have one question that probably doesn't relate to the barrier part, but the thing that looks like the Washington Monument, did, you, did they get into how these, these folks built these things? I mean, it looks like there's no trees or anything else around there. It was built out of stone. Well, it's not you know, wood. How did they get them to? The, how did they get them that high? You know, I mean, how well, did they build all yeah, these? Well, there's a question of how they, how, how they got. You know, they didn't even have wheels. Apparently, the, how, how did they get? How did they build the pyramids? Those are huge, huge yeah, blocks the of stone. You know, that, that, that thing went straight up. In the yeah. Middle of the desert. Yeah, and apparently, I, I think it was actually carved out of one piece of stone. That's what I understand. Oh. Other questions? Yes, over here, Ira. I mean. uh, is there any ancient uh, uh, digging or anything that would show if the area was actually green and it had trees at the time that the, this was taking place and that it's just a desert now? Since what, then? what area? Or was it that area around the... The Valley uh, of the Kings was always, uh, you know, very, that's why it was chosen, because it was dry and desolate. Okay. Uh, you know, because the, dry, you know, the drying process assists, uh, you know, the preservation, water, you know, moisture, uh, makes things rot and putrefy, and, and you know they did cover the mummies with tar. But um, the, the, you know that was that was part of the reason for selecting that area. Uh, they, they really sought to have a very dry, hot desert condition. We have time for one more question in the back. Yeah, I was wondering for this mummification procedure, do you think that still uh, preserve the brain somehow? Is there any possibility you believe they can be resurrected? Maybe? Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, the you know they they um, they, <coughs> they remove organs that would easily putrefy, and one of those organs was the brain. They you know remove the liver and the kidney and the intestines. These organs, if if they left them in, you know they they they, they could you know. The bacteria could get to them. You know, we actually already have lots of bacteria in our intestines. So they took all these things out and put them in special jars. Uh, but the brain uh, wasn't, it wasn't preserved at all. They didn't even put in, take it out and put it in a special jar. Uh, they, they, they had a sort of a, a roto-rooter, so to speak. They, they broke a hole in the nose, and they just sort of stirred it up. Uh, you know, the brain is mostly water anyway, and, uh, and uh, easily liquefied. So they just li liquefied it and sucked the liquid out. So uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, the Egyptians, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about, you know, by studying the DNA, the DNA is well preserved, you know, and that's part of why we're pretty sure that, you know, uh, uh, you know, of the ancestry and the, you know, the people buried in the Valley of the Kings uh, are, are who they say they were because you, you compare the DNA of one to the another, that's how they, they're pretty sure that Hatshepsut was buried in the Valley of the Kings, even though she was a woman, <laughs> uh, she was in the Valley of the Kings. Well, that was a wonderful presentation, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I'm a little bit envious that you got the opportunity to go and visit uh, all these sites in Egypt. It's on my list to do at some point. Top of the top on the on your bucket list. Well, I I s can certainly see why. You know. Ben is a well-known cryonaut, a well-known cryonicist. And there are others here in the church. Myself, we, we have these, uh, these bracelets that tell medical personnel that we are cryonicists, that in the event of something happening to our, us, in our, uh, if we are legally declared dead, we are not to be cremated, we are not to be autopsied, we are not to be embalmed and buried, but rather we are going to be frozen. And I, uh, I believe he talked a little bit about that in the beginning, but so, so it's our, our objective that should something happen to us that we be, be uh, cryonically suspended. And if you'd like more information on cryonics, we have a table downstairs that will give you information. Uh, the books are not available for borrowing tonight, but will be again January 28th when we'll open our library again at that presentation. But this whole church is about the concept of unlimited lifespans. The Church of Perpetual Life, this church is the only one of its kind, the only one of its kind in the whole world. It's the first of its kind, and I can envision 
uh, us doing a lot of great things here. And one of those things, obviously, is to bring to you presentations like this and presentations on the celebration of life and indefinite lifespans to let you know what's going on in the world. We had a most amazing article come out in the Washington Post just last month. On December the 2nd, the Washington Post quoted a Harvard professor, Dr. Church, as stating that he has reversed aging in a laboratory mouse, that he has reversed aging in a laboratory mouse, and that in five or six years, if he should have the funding that he needs, he will be able to do it for people. At that point in time, death becomes optional for the human species. For thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, people have wanted immortality and have dreamed of doing it by finding the fountain of youth through Ponce de Leon, through the processes that uh, Ben was just describing by the pharaohs in Egypt or the Neanderthals. Perhaps they were envisioning uh, afterlife. And what we're talking about is physical immortality where perhaps we don't have to die. Perhaps we can extend aging, uh, reverse aging for ourselves and extend a healthy human lifespan out for 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years perhaps? And if that's possible, imagine what could be available with medical science 100 years from now. Look at it 100 years ago where medical science was, how far it has come in the past 100 years, and ask yourself, where could it be 100 years from now? So these are things we can discuss more. Ben will be available for a personal discussion uh, this evening downstairs if you'd like to talk with him. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about our, our uh, concepts here. I, I refer to myself as an immortalist. I don't believe I ever will die. I expect to have the reversal of aging for this physical body. So here we, we refer to ourselves as immortalists, not because we have attained a state of immortality, but we have the faith at this church of perpetual life, we have the faith in humanity that aging will be reversed, that death is optional, that it will be optional through human efforts. We fully understand that this technology does not appear to be currently available, but the impressive history of human problem solving and technological advancements give us, give me the faith of its inevitability. We follow the philosophy of Nikolai Fedorovich Fedorov, a Russian philosopher, and this prophet Fedorov espoused his view, we espouse his views on using technology for the betterment of the human species, of our society, and the Creator's desire for immortality of man. And we can give you more information on Fedorov if you go to our website. Or if you ask me some questions afterwards, I'm happy to talk with you about all of these things. As mentioned, we have two other presentations this evening. One is a wonderful concert, and the after, after that we have the Peace Education Program, hosted by Larry Lustbader of Hollywood Beach. And that particular program will not be live streamed. So those of you who are watching live streaming, if you have a chance to get over here in about an hour, you can see it here live, but we will not be live streaming that program. We are working on potentially getting permission to do it next time, but I don't think we will. So if you'd like to see the Peace Education Program, you need to be here in person, and we'll be doing the first installment of, I'm not sure if it's 10 or 12 uh, installments of the Peace Education Program, which follows Prem Rawat, and we'll be doing it tonight after the concert, and again on Thursday nights. Now, it's not going to be this coming Thursday, but the week after, when the next installment of the Peace Education Program will be given here, and we'll keep in touch with you on these, uh, these presentations by email, or give us a call, and we can get you the information. So at this time, it gives me great pleasure. Well, first it gives me sadness to, to let you know that our wonderful fairy Elaine, Elaine Silver, is unable to be here in person tonight. I hope she and her husband are watching us from their sick bed. She uh, was supposed to be here tonight and was supposed to fly out to California from, from here tomorrow morning. Unfortunately, they caught this awful flu that's bug that's going around Florida, and uh, she's, uh, she's in bed sick and recovering. Hopefully we 
certainly will keep her in our thoughts and prayers that she recovers quickly. So in her place tonight, we have a gentleman named Charles B. Good. Charles B. Good is, uh, I'd like to let you know that we're going to keep things bouncing along with his diverse mix of classic rock, country folk, and originals. We have Charles B. Good straight up from Miami to perform for you this evening. He's a solo acoustic, and uh, he can be heard in some of the best venues in South Florida. Let's give a warm Hollywood welcome to our very own this evening, Charles B. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Start off with a song from Rod Stewart called Forever Young. <laughs> yep. Surround you when you're far at home and May you grow to be proud Dignified and true And do unto others as you have done to you so Be courageous and be brave In my heart you'll always stay Forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young. May good fortune be with you and your guiding light be strong. Build a stairway to heaven with a prince or a vagabond. And may you never love in vain. And in my heart, you will. Forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young. served you well All the wisdom of a lifetime no one can ever tell Whatever road you choose right behind you win or lose Forever young Forever young Forever young Thank you guys. Thank you very much. We're going to mix it up just a little bit to keep things rolling along. This is called Margaritaville. Living on sponge cake, watching the sun bake. All of those tourists covered with oil. 
on my front porch swing Strumming my six string Smelling the shrimp they're beginning to boil Wasting away again in Margaritaville Searching for my lost shaker of sidewalk And some people claim that there's a warm on the blame I don't know It's nobody's fault I don't know the reason I stay here all season Nothing to show but this brand new tattoo But it's a real beauty A Mexican cutie And how it got here I haven't a clue Wasting away again in Margaritaville Searching for my lost shaker of sidewalk And some people claim that there's a warm on the blame I don't know, it could be my fault That's right a flip-flop Stepped on a pop-top Got a cut on my heel Had to cruise on back home But there's booze in the blender And soon it will render That frozen concoction That helps me hang on Hang on, yeah Wasting away Margaritaville Searching for my lost shaker of sidewalk And some people claim that there's a warm on the blame I don't know It's my own damn fault I say uh, Some people claim that there's a But I know it's my own damn fault Thank you guys Thank you very much It's called taking care of business here Fishing you 
can be a musician If you can make sounds loud or mellow Get a second hand guitar, chances are you'll go far If you get in with the right bunch of fellows And people see you having fun, just a line in the sun You tell them that you like it that way if you ever get annoyed, look at me, I'm self-employed I like to work nothing all day And I've been taking care of business every day Taking care of business every way Taking care of business, it's alright Taking care of business and working overtime Work out, work it out yeah. That's right. Take good care of my business while I'm away every day. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, you get up every morning from a long clock swan and take the F 15 into the city. There's a whistle up above, people pushing, people shoving, and the girls are trying to make pretty. And if your chain's on time, you can get to work by nine. Start your slaving job and get your pay. If you ever get annoyed, look at me, I'm self employed. I like to work at nothing all day. And we've been taking care of business every day here, taking care of business every way here, taking care of business. It's alright, taking care of business, working overtime, work out, work it out. That's right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This next song is called The Letter. It goes back a while from the uh, original group. It's called the, the Four Box Tops. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, give me a ticket for an aeroplane. I ain't got time to take a fast train. Lonely days are gone, I'm going home My baby just to wrote me a letter Say so I don't care how much money I gotta spend I got to get back to my baby again Lonely days are gone, I'm going home My baby just to wrote me a letter But she wrote me a letter, said she couldn't I'm in no more Listen, Mr. Catch, you see I got to get back to my baby once more Anyway, give me a ticket for an aeroplane I ain't got time to take a fast train Lonely days are gone, I'm a going home My baby just to hold me a little Yeah, yeah, yeah For an aeroplane, I ain't got time to take a fast train. I said, Lonely days are gone, I'm a going home. My baby just threw me a little. I said, Lonely days are gone, I'm a going home. My baby just threw me a little. My baby just threw me a little. My baby just threw me.
Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. This song is called uh, Where I Want to Be. It's actually an original song, but thank you. It's driving me crazy when I think of you, baby. It's like a long, lazy, hazy afternoon. You put up with me without hesitating. The only thing I tell you is I'll be home soon with you. Is where I want to be with you. Is where I want to be. Things always changing and hearts rearranging. I never have to worry if there's one for me. If you ever wonder just for a moment, the only thing I know is someone wants to be with you is where I want to be with you is where I want to be. Even though the road gets lonely and even though the times get hard, heaven knows I need my angel and there you are holding it down for me all right here we go yeah Driving me crazy when I think of you, baby. It's like a long, lazy, hazy afternoon. You put up with me without hesitating. The only thing I tell you is I'll be home soon with you. It's where I want to be with you. It's where I want to be. Thank you very much, guys. I don't need a whole lots of money. I don't need no big fine car. I got everything that a man could want. I got more than I get asked for. I don't got to run around. I ain't got to stay out all night Cause I got me a sweet, sweet loving woman And she knows how to treat me right My baby, she's alright My baby, she's clean out of sight Don't you know that she is some kind of wonderful Some kind of wonderful, yeah, yeah some kind of wonderful, yeah, 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 yeah. When I hold her in my arms, you know she sets my soul on fire. Ooh, when my baby kisses me, my heart becomes filled with desire. When she wraps her loving arms around me, you know she baptizes my mind. And ooh, my baby kisses me, chills run up and down my spine. My baby, she's alright. My baby, she's clean out of sight. Don't you know that she is some kind of wonderful? Some kind of wonderful, yeah, yeah. Some kind of wonderful, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Is there anybody Got a sweet little woman like mine There's got to be somebody Got a sweet little woman like mine Whoa, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah I can't I get a witness I can't I get a witness Can I get a witness 
can I get a witness? How can I get a witness? How can I get a witness? Yeah, I'm talking about my baby has some kind of wonderful. 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 Yeah. Some kind of wonderful. Some kind of wonderful Some kind of wonderful Thank you guys very much Baby, I love your way. When shadows grow so long before my eyes And they're moving Across the page Suddenly the day turns into night Far away from the city Well don't, no, no, hesitate Cause your love, your love won't wait Oh Every day, I'm gonna tell you I love you. Way every day, I wanna be with you night and day, oh, baby, baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. The moon appears to shine and light the sky with the hell of some fireflies I wonder how they have the power to shine 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 I can see them under the pines but don't no no Hesitate Cause your love Your love won't wait Yeah, yeah, yeah Ooh, baby, I love you way Every day I'm gonna tell you I love you way Every day I wanna be with you night and day Baby, baby, yeah, yeah, Hesitate Cause your love Your love won't wait I can see the sunset In your eyes Brown and gray And blue besides Clouds are stalking 
islands in the sun I wish I could buy one out of season but don't no no hesitate cause your love your love won't wait yeah 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 I love you way every day. I wanna tell you I love you way every day. I wanna be with you night and day. Oh, baby, baby, yeah. Ooh, baby, I love you way every day. I'm gonna tell you I love you way. Every day now I wanna be with you night and day oh, Baby, baby, yeah, Thank you very much. Appreciate that. This song is called Wagon Wheel. South to the land of the pines I'm thumbing my way into North Carolina Staring up the road and I pray to God I see headlights I made it down the coast in 17 hours Picking me a bouquet of dogwood flowers And I'm hoping for rally You can see my baby tonight So rock me mama like a wagon wheel Rock me, mama, any way you feel Hey, mama, rock me Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain Rock me, mama, like a southbound train Hey, mama, rock me Yeah, yeah, yeah Running from the cold up in New England I was born to be a fiddler in an old time string band My baby plays a guitar, I pick a banjo now Well, North Country winners keep a getting me down Lost my money playing poker so I had to leave town But I ain't a turning back to living that old life no more so rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey, mama, rock me. So rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me, mama, like a southbound train. Hey, mama, rock me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Walking to the south, out of Roanoke, I caught a trucker out of Philly, had a nice long talk. But he's a heading west from the Cumberland Gap to Johnson City, Tennessee. I got to keep a move on before the sun. I hear my baby calling my name and I know that she's the only one. And if I die in rally, at least I will die free. 
So rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey, mama, rock me. Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me, mama, like a southbound train. Hey, mama, rock me. Yeah, rock me, mama, like a wagon wheel. Rock me, mama, any way you feel. Hey, mama, rock me. Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me, mama, like a southbound train. Hey, mama, rock me. Hey. Mama rock me Hey, mama rock me Hey, hey, hey mama rock me Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate that. The song probably most of you have heard is from a band called the, the Eagles. It's called Take It Easy. Well, I'm a running down the road trying to loosen my load. Got seven women on my mind. Four that want to owe me, two that want to stole me, one so she's a friend of mine. And take it easy, taking it easy. Don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy. Lighten up. While you still can I don't even try to understand Just find a place to make your stand And take it easy Well, I'm a bending on the corner of Winslow, Arizona Such a fine sight to see It's a girl, my lord, in a flatbed of four Slowing down to take a look at me Come on, baby, don't say maybe. I gotta know that your sweet love is gonna save me. We may win or we may lose, but we will never be a here again. So open up, I'm climbing in and take it easy. I'm a running down the road trying to loosen my load Got a world of trouble on my mind Looking for a lover who won't blow my cover She's so hard to find Take it easy, I'm taking it easy Don't let the sound of your own wheels drive you crazy Come on, baby don't say maybe I gotta know that your sweet love is gonna save me Take it easy. You gotta take it easy. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
A little bit of Eagles music. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, uh, made famous by Darius Rucker, uh, the gentleman that was a Hootie and the Blowfish. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who the author of the song was, but that's the guy who I heard do it. Yeah. Very catchy. Very catchy. A couple of years ago, that was all over the country radio. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I'm going to do a song from an artist uh, you've probably heard of. His name is Bob Marley. This is called Is His Love. <laughs> to love you and treat you right I want to love you every day and every night we'll be together with the roof right over our heads we'll share the shelter of my single bed we'll share the same room the job provides the bread Is this love, is this love, is this love The love that I'm feeling Is this love, is this love, is this love The love that I'm feeling Yeah, yeah, yeah I wanna know, wanna know, wanna know I want to know, want to know, want to know And I'm willing and able So I set my cards on the table I want to love you I want to love and treat, love and treat you right I want to love you Every day and every night we'll be together, together With the roof right over our heads, we'll share the shelter Of my single bed, we'll share the same room The job provides the bread is this love, is this love, is this love The love that I'm feeling Is this love, is this love, is this love The love that I'm feeling Yeah, yeah, yeah I wanna know, wanna know, wanna know I wanna know, wanna know, wanna know I'm willing and able So I throw my cards on the table Yeah Love is this love is this love the love that I'm feeling Is this love is this love is this love the love that I'm feeling Is this love is this love is this love the love that I'm feeling Is this love is this love is this love the love that I'm feeling Thank you very much. Switch it up, do a little song from uh, Eddie Money. It's called Two Tickets to Paradise.
got a surprise especially for you It's something that both of us have always wanted to do We've waited so long We've waited so long We've waited so long We've waited so long I want to take you on a trip so far from here I got two tickets in my pocket now baby We're gonna disappear We've waited so long We've waited so long We've waited so long We've waited so long I got Two tickets to paradise Won't you pack your bags and leave tonight I got two tickets to paradise I got two tickets to paradise Yeah, 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 yeah Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to take you on a trip so far from here I've got two tickets in my pocket now baby We're gonna disappear Why? We've waited so long We've waited so long We've waited so long We've waited so long, waited so long. I got Two tickets to paradise Won't you pack your bags and leave tonight I got two tickets to paradise I got two tickets to paradise I got two tickets to paradise Won't you pack your bags and leave tonight I got two tickets to paradise I got two tickets to paradise Thank you very much. This next song is a real fun one. It's from a band uh, called CCR, Greetings Clearwater Revival, and it's called Suzy Q. Oh, Suzy Q. Suzy Q. Suzy Q, baby, I love you, Suzy Q. I like the way you walk. I like the way you talk. I like the way you walk. I like the way that you talk, Suzy Q. Say that you'll be mine. Say that you'll be mine. Say that you'll be mine, Suzy, all the time, Suzy Q. Oh, Suzy Q. Suzy Q. Suzy Q, baby, I love you, Suzy Q. Say that you'll be true Say that you'll be true 
say that you'll be true and never leave me blue. Susie Q, I like the way you walk. I like the way you talk. I like the way you walk. I like the way that you talk. Susie Q, whoa, Susie Q. Suze Q, Suze Q, baby, I love you. Suze Q, baby, I love you. Suze Q, baby, I love you. Suze Q. Thank you very much. This is called As Long As You Love Me. And although loneliness has always been a friend of mine I'm leaving my life in your hands And people say I'm crazy and that I am blind But risking it all in a glance And how you got me blind is still a mystery I can't get you out of my head I don't care what is written in your history As long as you're here with me I don't care who you are or where you're from Don't care what you did As long as you love me Who you are or where you're from Don't care what you did As long as you love me And every little thing that you have said and done it feels like it's deep within me It doesn't really matter if you're on the run It feels like we're meant to be I don't care who you are or where you're from Don't care what you did As long as you love me Who you are or where you're from Don't care what you did As long as you love me, baby yeah. That's right Oh yeah, yeah Try to hide it so that no one knows But I guess it shows When I look into your eyes Where you been and where you going to I don't care As long as you love me, baby As long as you love me I don't care who you are or where you're from don't care what you did as long as you love me who you are or where you're from don't care what you did as long as you love me baby yeah well, that's right oh yeah yeah you're from, don't care what you did, as long as you love me, who you are, where you're from, don't care what you did, as long as you love me, who you are, as long as you love me, what you did, as long as you love me, baby. Thank you very much. This is called Forever Young. Mm -hmm. 
May the good Lord be with you down every road you roam And may sunshine and happiness surround you when you're far at home And may you grow to be proud, a dignified and true And do unto others as you'd have done to you so be courageous and be brave And in my heart you'll always stay Forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young May good fortune be with you, may your guiding light be strong Build a stairway to heaven with a prince or a vagabond May you never love in vain And in my heart you will remain Forever young, forever young, forever young, forever young Forever young served you well For all the wisdom of a lifetime no one can ever tell But whatever road you choose I'm right behind you win or lose Forever young Forever young Forever young Forever young Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. You got it, Neil. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie, be good. Appreciate that. Well, now, I enjoyed it. And I, what you didn't know is that we were downstairs listening to you through the live stream we had downstairs. So you, were, you, had, you had all the people downstairs. Plus, we had, I think, six or seven people online watching you from all over the world. I believe someone in Russia was watching you as well. So there we are. And you'll be able to see this uh, tonight or tomorrow on our YouTube channel. It's been recorded, and it will be available for your pleasure, your viewing pleasure. And I'd like to let those people who are online that uh, have tuned in and have been watching, I hope you enjoyed the presentation, but we are about to go offline as we are about to go into another program, which is... Yes, I will, I will, Doug. But before I do, I want to introduce a few people. If you don't mind standing, Sylvia Anderson and Larry Lustbader in, over here. We've got Peter Gustafson and Alberto Bonilla. And these are all volunteers for the Prem Rawat Foundation. And we're very happy to have you here tonight. And they're here presenting the Peace Education Program. This program is starting tonight. It has many chapters. So tonight is the first installment of the Peace Education Program. And the next time that uh, chapter two, if you will, will be presented here at the Church of Perpetual Life on Thursday, a week from two days from now. So that's 14, what's that, the 21st, I believe? I'm guessing it's the 21st of, uh, of January. But uh, if you have any questions on that, we'll be happy to keep you in touch with all of those things. So let's bring up to the dais our new good friend, Mr. Peter Gustafson. Peter, come on up.
Thank you, Neil. Thank you. I don't know if I need this. I think it's your choice. You think I do? I think don't you, you think it's a better? That are hard of hearing might be good. Anybody who's hard of hearing should be sitting in the front. So tonight, we're introducing the Peace Education Program uh, here at the Church of Perpetual Life. This is sponsored by the Church of Perpetual Life under the guidance of the Prem Rawat Foundation. Prem Rawat Foundation was started by Prem Rawat to introduce to people the possibility of peace, personal peace. This workshop consists of 10 one-hour sessions or 10 one-hour workshops presented over a period of time. Each workshop runs one hour. There'll be a series of videos. In between the videos, there will be two minutes for reflection. We'll have some music in the background. Maybe if people that are here wish to express something that they've understood or felt or whatever in those two minutes, we can drop the volume of the music or we can just let people silently enjoy their reflections. Very, very simple. Prem Rawat has been speaking around the world in front of 12 plus million people. This program is being put on all over the world by many, many, many different organizations, governments, by mayors of towns, by, again, extremely varied. It's done in prisons and schools and anything you can think of, it's probably where it's being presented. So I don't have much to say Doug, if you're ready to start, we will start tonight's workshop. Ah, the name of tonight's workshop is, I have to look that up. I have a very limited memory. Do you know it?